Okay. Hello, everybody. I am a little early. So talk amongst yourselves while we get ready. I'm going to go in here and just get my banners ready. Yep. Okay. I think we've got everything. All right. Let me just get all my notes and whatnot in order. And then we can be about the business of fancy dancing. Here, let's scoot that back a little bit so I can have some room for my notes. Make it. There we go. Okay. All right. Let me just share this really quickly. And then we will be talking about our books. Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining me. We're going to get started in about two minutes. Let me see who's in the comment section. Introduce yourself. Say hello. And then I'll be sure to give you a shout out. I think I know who that is. If it's you, hey, girl. All right. Let me see here real quick. Just need to go in here and share this live stream. And then we will be about the business of fancy dancing. What are we doing? There we go. And then we're just going to share. Let's discuss a song for the wild built by Becky Chambers. Okay, great. All right, that is shared. Okay, let me, you know what? I'm gonna put this over here. I can have me a little extra, it's like having two cameras. There we go, okay. Oh good, we only have one minute, it's only 401, that's perfect. Let me just look in the comment section real quick. Everybody's dandy. Let's check these banners out. All right. Y'all know the drill. Share the live stream because it is going to be a good one today. Let me get my papers in order. And then we are going to get busy talking about this awesome, awesome book. Oh, you know what? One thing I forgot to do. Hold on, y'all. I forgot to do one thing, and then we actually can get started. The most important thing I forgot. Hello. Let's go in here. Let's do this. All right, then all I have to do is do this, and that's not what I want to do. I want to do this. Yep. Okay, it's processing. Sorry, y'all, I had to upload my um, PDF real quick. There was some tiny technical difficulties, but we are 
going to work through those. Hello, everyone. Hello, live stream viewers. Hello, replay viewers. Thank you, everybody, for joining me today as we discuss our book, A Psalm for the Wild, built by Becky Chambers. Ooh, child, what happened? Mm -mm. I hovered over something and touched something or, or another. I didn't like that. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. But anywho, there we go. Okay, let me see if I can make this bigger. I think I'm going to do... There we go. There we go. Okay, so today's book is A Psalm for the Wild, built by Becky Chambers. Now, let me see if it'll let me... Oh, perfect. No. Let me see if I can do this mouse. Okay, but before we get into this wonderful books, we're going to have a couple of announcements real quick, okay? So first off, I'd like to announce the Latino, Latinx, Latina Book Festival. That's a whole bunch of words, but it's the, it's the Latino, Latinx Book Festival. It's going to be September 15th and 16th of this year in, in Rawlings at the Rawlings Library on the fourth floor. On the 15th, we are going to be having an event with Marcelo Hernandez Castillo, and he wrote, or they wrote, because I don't know your um, preferred pronoun, sorry, friend, Children uh, children of the Land. It's a memoir. Um, and then on September, oh, and that one is going to be, it's the featured event. event. You can go to the library website for more information. So that's PuebloLibrary.org. On the 16th at 10.30 a.m., we'll be having an event with Michael Espinoza, um, and he wrote Trial of the Espinoza Outlaws. Ooh, I wonder if they're some of your relatives. Um, let me hush. Let's see what else is going on. Yeah, so that is always fun. Um, I've, I've been to the Latino Book Festival many, many, many times. I hope y'all can make it. It's a wonderful time. You get to learn about um, all these wonderful books and authors. There's delicious food. Um, one time there was a flamenco dancer. Oh, that was so much fun. That was the year that Benjamin Sayez was the featured guest. <coughs> Um, and he's absolutely amazing. Just a wonderful, wonderful author. Um, so if you could join us for that, that would be great. Um, another thing that we have coming up that's in October is All Pueblo Reads. I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but I'm kind of excited because it's got a nautical theme to it. Um, it is, uh, there, we're doing three books. Well, first of all, let me explain what All Pueblo Reads is. It's an annual event where we encourage all the citizens of Pueblo to read the same books. Their author talks, book signings, and even a black tie ball, which is a lot of fun. Um, so the we have three books this year. The first one is Remarka Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt. That's the adult one and the one for the high schoolers. Um, and this one is about a, a woman who works in an aquarium and she is, she cleans up at, at the end of the night and one of her sons went missing and she gets some help from the least person that you would expect. There is a curmudgeon um, octopus at this aquarium named Marcellus. He also was a detective apparently because he's gonna help her find out what happened to her baby. Um, then there is a fourth grade through eighth grade book. It's by Lynn Kelly and it's called Songs for a Well. And then there is a K through three book called Over and Under the Pond. And that one is by Kate Messen, Messer, Messner. Um, and so those are gonna be coming later in October. There's gonna be a lot more um, information. You can go to the library's website right now and that's just pueblolibrary.org slash all Pueblo Reads to get more information about that. Specifically here at LAM, the best branch in the whole district if I don't say so myself, if I do say so myself, because I just did, <laughs> um, we're going to be having a Tangled Yarn support group. Um, basically, it's a social fibers art group at LAM where people get together and crochet and knit. Um, that's going to be on September the 6th and the 20th at 7 p.m. Um, let's see what else. Ooh, -wee, that's right, y'all. There is another book club here at LAM. It's called the Horror Cafe, a book club to die for. This month's book is Rosemary's Baby by Ira Levin. Um, it's going to be August the 30th at 7 p.m. And they really do serve lattes, y'all. So y'all should come and discuss some scary books and sip some coffee. 
Um, and be scared while you do it. Let's see what else. Last and not least. Well, this is not the last one, actually. Um, we have our teen and tween night here at LAM, our hangout on Tuesdays at 3.45 all the way till 5.30. We do art. We play games. We um, do crafts. Sometimes there's snacks. Y'all notice I keep mentioning the snacks because I'm all about those. So please come by and say hello um, and hang out with us for a little bit. Okay, let's see what else. This one. Uh, let's see. Let me um, put myself right here so you can see. There we go. Okay, so we have extended summer reading all the way to the end of August. And I've made book bundles. Whoops. How come you can't see it? What's going on? Ha, ah, there we go. <laughs> I've made book bundles. So these are going to be um, distributed throughout um, the kids section um, here at LAM. All you have to do is flip up the little, hang on, let me see if I can do this. Here we go. All you have to do is lift the little flaps here, and then you can read all about whatever the, the title of the book is. So this is the cover of the book. And then you just lift the flap, and it'll give you a brief synopsis. We want to encourage all the youth of Pueblo to continue reading, not only in the summer, but throughout the whole year. So we're still giving away prizes. Um, we're still, uh, we have a spinning wheel with lots of fun games and whatnot as well. So we hope that you can come by before the end of the year, get your prizes, get some free books, and get to know the library a little bit better. All right. So now, let me, hold on. Now we're going to get started with our featured presentation. So for this month's selection, this month's book is the first in a series, um, and it's called A Psalm for the Wild, built by Becky Chingman. Hold on, let me. Let me see. There we go. A Psalm for the Wild built by Becky Chambers. <laughs> so this book has been, uh, it was uh, critically acclaimed, um, first in a series, and it even won the Hugo Award for 2022. So hold on, let me see if I'm missing anything. Let me read a, um, hold on, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, y'all. There we go. Um, so let, let me go on and read the book synopsis. So <clears throat> it's been centuries since the robots of Panga gained self-awareness and laid down their tools. Centuries since they wandered in mass into the wilderness, never to be seen again. Centuries since they faded into myth and urban legend. One day, the life of a tea monk is upended by the arrival of a robot there to honor the old promise of checking in. The robot has one question, what do people need? But the answer to that question depends on who you ask and how. They're going to need to ask a lot. So the overall premise of this book is in a world where people have what they want, does having more matter, basically. Um, so let's jump in to who wrote the book. So um, also, um, before, before we pass on that, um, A Psalm for the Wild Built belongs to a genre called hope punk. You'll sometimes see it referred to as solar punk, um, but that's a subset of hope punk. And some of the tenets of hope punk is it's a subgenre of speculative fiction and art that shows optimism, gentleness, kindness, and collaboration to be effective tools to create a better future. Now, a lot of y'all have probably heard of cyberpunk and that was made popular by people um, like William Gibson and Philip K. Dick. William Gibson did the, the necromancer or the new romancer, not the necromancer, that's somebody else. Uh, Johnny Mnemonic. Uh, Philip K. Dick did do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Y'all know that as Blade Runner, but the real title is The Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. And it was kind of grim and dark and gritty. Well, some people wanted something that was a bit more hopeful. And so that's where um, Hope Punk 
was born out of. There's a lot of other books that fall in this genre, but we'll get to that later after we discuss this current book. So here's Becky Chambers. Um, let's read a little bit about her. So Becky Chambers is a science fiction author based in Northern California. She is best known for her Hugo award-winning Wayfarer ser series. Her books have been nominated for the Author C. Clark Award, the Locust Award, and the Women's Prize for Fiction, among others. Chambers has a background in the performing arts and grew up in a family heavily involved in space science. She spends her free time playing video and tabletop games, keeping bees, and looking through her telescope. Having hopped around the world a bit, she's now back, she's now back in her home state where she lives with her wife. She hopes to see Earth from orbit one day. And that is Becky Chambers. All right. So um, some of the major themes that we're going to talk about in this book. Hang on, let's do this. Let me see what this looks like. No, let's do this. There we go. No. I'm sorry, y'all. I don't mean to keep playing played in your faces. There we go. So, um, there we go. That's better. Okay. So some of the major themes, oh, I see why I did that. Some of the major themes of this book are rewilding, overpopulation, uh, oil overuses, and honestly, therapy. Um, I really enjoy this book. Um, we have it available in an audio version as well as a print copy. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and so the, the book begins uh, in the garden with Dex. Dex is a, a non-binary non tea monk. Well, they, they become a tea monk, but they start off as a gardener. And they are just feeling kind of burnt out and ho-hum about their job. Um, they're not really happy. They don't know why. Um, they've gone to the doctor just to make sure nothing was wrong. They've checked their head, their heart, their everything. Um, and it just is, Dex is feeling some kind of way about life and their place in it. And so this book ends up exploring what that is and what could have caused that. Um, one of the things that, um, first of all, let's just talk about the title of the book, A Psalm for the Wild Built. So a lot of y'all might be familiar with the, um, a lot of y'all might be familiar with the word Psalm from the Bible. And a psalm is a poem, a sacred poem, or a sacred hymn. And so as we read the book, we learn that the wild built are robots who were built from the leftover parts um, from the first robots who gained consciousness. And in this book, they never explain how that even happened, how it came about. It's been that long that nobody really knows. And if anybody does know, they didn't tell us. Um, and there are, um, Panga is a moon. And so it's got a limited population. Um, and it is a moon that orbits a planet that we don't even really get into in this book at all. Um, because that's not really the point of the book is to explore a lot of things. Like I said, what is, what is meaning of life? What's my place in it? What does a meaningful life look like? What does meaningful work look like? So that's the main focus. But I thought it was interesting that they never actually said, you know, on this day, a solar flare happened or a sun burst and then all the robots woke up and gained consciousness and said, bye, see you later. Um, but that's what, you know, th they didn't explain that. So anywho, um, sibling Dex, that's Dex. That's how they refer to this particular clerical order, their siblings, you know, kind of like how um, some monks are brothers and some nuns or sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so. These are siblings. Also because Dex is um, uh, gender non-conforming, so they use they, them pronouns. So anywho, the first question that we're going to jump into is Chambers dedicates a song for the wild built for anybody who could use a break. And Hold on, let me scooch up a little bit. There. And begins in the first chapter with Dex's feeling burnt, uh, feelings of burnt burnout. Sometimes, it, and here, this is quoting, sometimes a person reaches a point in their life when it becomes absolutely essential to get the H-E and two hobby sticks out of the city. The, I'm trying not to cuss because we, we don't do that here. Um, but, you know, if you read the book, you know exactly what Dex said. 
So the question is, how has burnout affected you in recent years? And can you relate to Dex's feelings about the city and their need to get out? So um, I am not going to pretend to uh, answer for everybody, but um, I am going to maybe ask you to think about um, during lockdown for the pandemic um, that we're still experiencing, but definitely during lockdown, there was um, a lot of people maybe not knowing what to do with themselves, having certain feelings of restlessness um, and figuring, trying to figure out how to handle it. So um, absolutely, yes, I can absolutely relate to Dex's feelings of feeling burnt out um, and trying to figure out how to recuperate from that. Um, I got so burnt out at one point that I couldn't read books anymore. Can you imagine working at a library and not being able to read books anymore? And by by not being able to read books anymore, what my definition is, is um, on average, I was probably reading about six books a month. Um, and after my period of burnout, which happened shortly before lockdown, I was probably getting maybe two books in. I don't know. That's when I discovered audiobooks and how wonderful they could be. Um, because my attention just couldn't, I couldn't keep my attention. I was distracted. I was stressed out. And that's how I knew something was wrong because I've been reading ever since I figured out how to do it. Actually, even before then, I don't think I learned how to read until I was in the first grade. So I was probably six or seven. They later found out I was dyslexic, but I was still reading those picture books and telling stories. I am the storyteller in my family. So um, when I couldn't read at the rate that I was used to. I was like, ooh, something don't feel right. Something's wrong. And it was. I was burnt out. Um, and so was Dex in this book. Um, and they they really think that maybe if they change their job, that will make it better. Um, and they even say so. If they thought maybe if they had good food and good sex, that would make it better. And it didn't. It's very much like Solange's song, Crane in the Sky. It is very much like that. Um, uh, and actually I was thinking about that when I was reading the book, I'm like, this sounds like Solange. I wonder if Becky Chambers was listening to Solange a little bit when she was writing this book. Cause that's what it sounds like to me. So if anybody else can, um, relate to these feelings of burnout, or if you want to talk about it, let me know in the comment section and I can actually uh, have you on in the live stream. If you want, I know that that can be kind of personal and you might not want to talk about it with everybody all on the internet. So that's fine too. We could talk about it later when you see me. Because I know a lot of y'all do that. Y'all come up to me in the library and tell me about how you watch me on the live stream and whatnot. So that's cool too. Um, let's see what else. I want to remind y'all to sign up for this newsletter. Also too, uh, to take a little break between questions. Um, I do have a newsletter. I send out the, the uh, at least once or twice a month. Um, if you are interested in being on the newsletter, you'll get the whole list of all the books we're reading, all the questions, synopsis, um, interviews of the uh, author and whatnot. It's a bunch of fun. Um, so I highly encourage it. There is the link right there to send you to the newsletter. All right. Also, I'm sorry. It's a little hot in here. So I have the fan going and it's kind of making my papers go all over the place. But let me see if I can adjust this. Okay. So number two. Um, oh, hold on one second. Let me see, because I have a whole page of quotes from the book, because I really like this book quite a bit. Um, no, I don't have one for that question. All right, so um, during their first experience as a tea monk, sibling Dex quickly realizes that although they look like they know what they're doing, they are lost in how to conduct themselves and help the person who has sought them out. Was there ever a time you had to feign confidence or knowledge to seem like you knew what you were doing? Kind of fake it until you make it. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Go and go back and watch some of the earlier uh, uh, episodes of Lovely's Digital Book Club and see, you know, I knew about the book, but then I have to 
click and do all these things with the computer and make the slides. My slides have gotten way, way better. Um, me understanding how to use the the StreamYard, which is the the technology that we use to present this to you, has gotten way better. I don't even think we had a green screen when I first was doing this. I'm almost certain we didn't, so I had to learn how to do that and how to make slides and how to make this interesting um, for everybody involved. Ooh, look at that. That has blocked my face. Let me there. So I had to learn how to do all of that stuff. Um, so yeah, I think sometimes faking it until you make it until you get the experience to have the confidence um, to back things up is just a regular thing that a lot of people have to go through. So when uh, sibling Dex was first starting off as a team monk, they have this thing where you could be in do an apprenticeship and they didn't want to. They was like, nope, I'm going to just learn on the go and learn on the fly. And somebody uh, had come to them and their cat had just died and they were crying and upset. Their cat died. Their marriage was all weird. And it became, uh, you know, Dex was trying to serve them tea and it was their first time. And the person ended up realizing that, that Dex hadn't done this before and didn't really know what they were doing. Um, but they muddled through it. They ended up actually consoling Dex a little bit and Dex consoled them. And then they got better and better and better. Um, and I think that's the, the thing right there is that sometimes people are not willing to be uncomfortable or awkward while they're learning how to do things, especially if things usually come easy to you. It can be really frustrating when something is kind of hard because you're not used to that. But practicing is how you get better. So, yeah, sometimes you got to fake it until you make it. Um, and to in the book, that works in Dex's favor because they have to um, make tea um, and make tea for people and listen to their, their struggles, their triumphs, their passions, their pains. Um, and they end up making specific tea for specific people, like individual, like they'll mix different herbs and, and spices and stuff to make a unique blend for a specific person. And that kind of experience only comes through trial and error. And so by the time Dex comes, Dex starts their adventure, which they meet a uh, speckle covered moss cap. Is that that robot's full name? Because Moss Cap is their name, but their full name, I think, is called Speckle Covered Moss Cap. Because the um, robots in the wild built have a tradition of naming themselves after the first thing that they see. Maybe a Splendid Covered Moss Cap. Hang on, let me see. Nope. Yes, it is. Um, the robot's name is Splendid Speckled Moss Cap, but Moss Cap for short. Um, anywho. And so um, by the time Dex reach, uh, meets Moss Cap, they are renowned throughout Panga of being such a good tea monk, knowing how to blend the perfect tea at the perfect temperature for the perfect occasion. Um, but they still have this emptiness that they're feeling about themselves and they feel guilty. Um, and one of the themes that um, runs through this books is... Um, bugs and animals is really, really close to nature. And part of what sends Dex off into the wild is they never grew up with the sound of crickets. And so they're like, I don't know what a cricket sounds like. Uh, remember, again, they're on a the moon. Um, they've lived there for forever and ever. They go back generations and generations. And so there used to be um, crickets all over the place back in the day, but something happened. They call this age when the robots... Um, gained sentience or consciousness, they called that the age of automation. And so they were right at the age of automation um, at the beginning of it. And then the robots woke up and walked away. And so the robots were meant to be helpers for the humans and not take over all their chores, but that's exactly what happened. So when the robots walked up and left uh, and walked away, people had to fill in the gaps. They had to figure out... Um, how to get along without the robots. Because now if you make them come back and fulfill a purpose that is not theirs, you've basically enslaved them. And nobody wants to be an enslaver. Well, some people do, but they're evil. Anywho, um, 
And so, but these people decide not to do that. And in fact, in the book, they talk about how the the whole culture is has an environmental built to it. And I don't know if it is because they live on a moon. Like, I don't know how they got to the moon. I don't know if these people always lived on the moon or if they was on a planet that the moon orbits and they had to leave the planet because of overpopulation. I either skipped that or they just didn't go into detail about that. But what I do know is that they talk about the buildings being built of some kind of transparent casing, like the kind of stuff you put sausage in, um, and uh, a mycelium, which is mushroom. So like mycelium builds and whatnot. And they do that so that it doesn't leave a lasting impact on the environment. And so that once that building's purpose has been served or it's no longer in use, then it's easier for the environment to just kind of take over again. Um, and we'll see what happens uh, later in the book. They talk about the sh factory where all the first generation robots were built. And this factory was not built with the environment in mind. It was made out of steel. And um, it was just there kind of vacant and in, 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 in the middle of the wilderness as it was slowly being decomposed. Um, that's a metaphor as well, too, for things that used to be that maybe led us to this new way of rewilding or trying to live in harmony with our environment versus dominating it. Anywho, <clears throat> excuse me. <coughs> um, let me go on and check these questions real quick. I mean, the comments. Make sure everything, everybody is being paid attention to. All right. Remember, if you are enjoying the talk so far, please share the live stream. It lets the algorithm know that you like what I'm doing and you can spread it to other people who you think might also enjoy talking about awesome books and robots who know about more about humanity than certain monks. Okay, so let's see. Crickets and bears are two prominently featured animals in a psalm for the wild built. Crickets have been known to represent good luck, fortune, wait, good fortune or luck, while bears can be known to represent strength, family, vitality, courage, and health. Why do you think Chambers selected these two animals in particular? Were there other creatures that stood out to you? So, yeah, I mean, I think that um, this the, these could be metaphors of some sort. Hold on, let me see what's going on here. Okay, let's go back here. Um, I think that they could be metaphors of some sort, um, but also it could just be very on the nose. Um, the crickets were the whole reason um, that Dex went on their journey and ended up going off the trail and off the path in the first place because they hadn't heard crickets before. Um, crickets in my culture are known to carry messages. So when you hear the crickets making that creak, 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 um, I'm doing that because they rub their little legs together. Um, my grandmother's, here I go again, mentioning my grannies. That's right, I'm gonna find a way to work them in every story because they're my foundation, they're my ancestors. Um, but we were taught not to kill crickets because they carry messages. And if you kill a cricket, you're killing the message. So don't kill them. Um, uh, and so I think that the crickets were what lured Dex to a new understanding. Um, but again, they ha are known for luck and fortune in other co uh, cultures. And it, it was luck and fortune because if Dex had never gone off the path, they never would have ran into sp splendid speckled moss camp. Let me get this robot's name right. I don't want no uprising. To happen to me. Yes, Splendid Speckled Moss Cat. So the robots name themselves after the first thing that they see when they wake up. Um, and what do you mean by wake up, lovely? Well, in the book, they talk about um, how the robots or the wild built robots are born. They do not come from a factory. What happens is, is when robots run down, aka die, 
then those parts are taken and they build other robots out of those parts. So a new robot is born. Those are basically their parents. And throughout the book, Moss Cap is talking to Dex and having to explain to, to Dex how they're alive and they're sentient and they are very similar to one another, even though they're so different. Let me see if I can find one of the quotes that talks about that. <clears throat> There is one where they talk about they don't have to be this, uh, exactly the same to be of equal value. I don't. I'm sorry, y'all. <clears throat> I thought I uh, I thought I put the quote in here, but I did not. So, anywho, that's okay. So, but so Dex does end up running into Moss Cap. And, oh, I forgot to finish my thought about the crickets and the bear. Sorry. I also think that the crickets and the other bugs represent bugs in the system, like bugs, things that are, are wrong or quirky. Um, nobody wants bugs in their system. And I'm talking about maybe bugs in your house or your home or your place of work, but also bugs in a computer or anything mechanical. It can represent uh, a breakdown or a problem. But also, there can also be a ghost in the machine um, that can make things sentient. And what looks like a problem at first might not necessarily really be one. It really depends on how you look at it and how you handle it. So I think that's another thing that was the issue there, too. There were lots of foxes and bears and things like that, too. And I really think that Becky Chambers put them in the book just to make a point that we're all different and we're all going about our lives Um in different ways, but we have the same goal. We want to eat, we want to be safe, and we don't want to be scared. Like no animal really likes being scared. Um, and they all want, need shelter and food, all of us, from the teeniest, tiniest little ant or nematode to the biggest giant tiger or lion. All of us need food and shelter and safety. And so I think that was the point of her putting that in the book. Also, they're out in the wilderness. Um, the one thing that she talks about, and I think we're going to end up, ah, here we go. It is, um, while discussing whether or not to leave the road to collect water and disturb ecosystems in the process, Sibling Dex argues that everybody thinks they're the exception to the rule, and that's exactly where the trouble starts. One person can do a lot of damage. So what are your thoughts on Dex's statement? In response, Moss Cap states, sometimes damage is unavoidable. Do you agree or disagree with Moss Cap and why? So I do believe that one person can do a lot of damage. Um, in this case, yes, directly damaging an ecosystem. But also, any of y'all ever been to work and one person was upset or grumpy? And everybody in the office knew it? And you had your day go after that. If that person's attitude didn't improve, everybody felt it. Everybody knew what was going on. So one person can do a lot of damage, but also one person can do a lot of good. I think that also in this book, when they were talking about um, one person doing a lot of damage, they were talking about um, how in the, in the wild, in the wilderness, there is a whole ecosystem that we cannot see. There is the mycelium running, running underneath the soil, um, connecting all the trees and other plants. There are ants, there are nematodes, there are worms, and we cannot see them. But to get where you need to go, sometimes you have to go off the beaten path. And when you're going off the beaten path and you're walking on the grass, you're tromping all over these, these people's houses. You're crushing the mycelium's pathway. You're stomping on the 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 green green winged laced wig i'm just saying that because i'm a gardener and you want to see those in your garden because uh, they be eating all them bugs like the uh, japanese beetles and stuff um but you're not paying attention to the fungi necessarily and they need to be in that ecosystem to make it balanced um but sometimes even if you're a vegan or a vegetarian you are still contributing to the the harm of other things 
like all the pesticides that they use to to kill all those bugs and stuff on on your fruits and vegetables probably about a bowl full per each meal if you really want to think about it um that is a type of harm um it's a is it a necessary harm for for some of us to stay alive absolutely um are there better ways for us to go about harming less so that we can all live yes yes there is um, I do think that there is a quote about that, too, about how Panga is divided. And um, let me see. Ah, here we go. 50% of Panga's single continent was designated for human use. The rest was left to nature and the ocean was barely touched at all. It was a crazy split, if you thought about it. Half the land for a single species, half for the hundreds of thousands of others. But then humans had a knack for throwing things out of balance. Finding a limit they, they'd stick to was victory enough. Um, and so sometimes you have to take the victory where you can get it. Is that a perfect balance? No. Is it the best that they could do? Probably no either. But was it something that they did and stick to, stuck to? Yes, yes. And so there in that in, in that answer lies, hey, we are going to do our best. Um, and we're going to do our best knowing that we can also do a little bit more, basically. Okay, so another thing that I really liked about this book, let me see where my questions go. We're not going to talk about that question. How much time do we have here? Oh, okay. Let's go to the next slide. Hold on. So here are some, some questions that the book poses. I said questions are journal prompts because I think that these are questions that a lot of us could just sit down and write in our little journals and answer for our own lives. So the one thing, what do humans really want? What does a meaningful life look like? And how do you find meaningful work? And so those are, I'm not going to attempt to answer those questions right now because they're, they're going to be 15 million different answers, but those are things that you can think about. What do humans want? What does a meaningful life look like? I will answer that for me. A meaningful life to me looks like something where I have contributed to society. Um, I, I have friends and family who respect me and invest in me as I invest in them. Um, that I have been kind to uh, the people around me and those in my environment. And I don't mean just people. I mean plants, animals, trees, bugs. As kind as I can be. Kind is different than nice, okay? Okay. Kind is different than nice. Nice nice means you tell people what they want to hear. Kind means you tell people what they need to hear in a kind way. You don't have to hit people over the head being kind. You don't have to be blunt. Um, anywho, so again, Dex thought that when they became a tea monk, this empty feeling of angst that they had would go away. They started talking about how they have family and friends who love them. They've had lovers at the monastery. The people around them love them, but something was just missing. So they go off and be a tea monk. And it got better for a little while, probably because they had to have the challenge of growing their own herbs and learning how to do the tea service and helping people and traveling from town to town to town. But something was still missing. And Dex was like, I don't know why I have all of this good fortune um, and I still don't feel what my purpose is. And so... Um, uh, Moss, Moss Cap starts talking to Dex. And here's one of the things, One of the, it's a long quote, but I really like it. So I'm going to read all of it. You're an animal, sibling Dex. You're not separate or other. You're an animal and animals have no purpose. Nothing has a purpose. The world simply is. If you want to do things that are meaningful to others, fine, good. So do I. But if I wanted to crawl into a cave and watch the lagmites with frost frog, Frost Frog is another robot. For the remainders of my days, that would also be both fine and good. You keep asking why your work is not enough, and I don't know how to answer that because it is enough to exist in the world and marvel at it. You don't need to justify that or earn it. You're allowed to just live. That is all most animals do. 
I personally think that that might be a commentary on maybe capitalism or Western society in general, where sometimes people think they have to earn rest. Um, they have to earn luxury. No, you don't. No, you don't. We it, it, human beings are uh, apex predators um, and we need rest. I mean, lions sleep for 14, 15 hours a day because they're apex predators and they put a lot of energy into getting that gazelle or that zebra or elephant. They need to leave them elephants alone because them elephants are going to stomp them into the ground. But anyway, you know what I mean. And so after they do that and they eat their fill and they lay down and take a nap, you need to lay down and take a nap too. Um, you need to be wary of always thinking that you have to be producing something um, to be worthy. Like a lot of a lot of people have turned their hobbies, something that used to be fun for them, into a job because people are always thinking, "How do I monetize this? How do I make more money? Multiple streams of income, myself included." But there has got to be something that you do just to replenish your soul, just to um, fulfill. <coughs> <coughs> pardon me, just to fulfill you. Um, there is a book called by Devin Price, Dr. Devin Price, D-E-V-O-N. Hold on, let me put it in the comment section. And it's called, I think it's called Laziness is Not Real. It's by Dr. D-E-V-O-N Price. I think it's called Laziness is Not Real. Hold on. Let me look it up real quick on the internet. Dr. Devin Price Books. It's called Laziness Does Not Exist. That's what it is. So it's called Laziness Does Not Exist. Let me go and put this in here. That uh, That's a really good read. And it will help people understand L A. Hold on, let me make sure I'm spelling this right. Y'all know I'm dyslexic, and so I have to double check everything because sometimes I'm not sure I'm spelling stuff right. Let's do this. There. Let's see. Hi. Dr. Devin Price. Yep, Laziness Does Not Exist by Dr. Devin Price. We actually have a hard copy of that book. It's a really good read. It will help you wrap your brain around some of the more Puritan ideas that this country was founded on. Um, maybe capitalist ideas as well. I don't want to blame it all on capitalism. I, that's just the only system I ever lived in, so I don't know nothing about no so socialism. Other than the libraries, that's socialism. You're welcome. So all them streets and the fire department, that's socialism too. Um, but anywho, I meant is a, a larger form of governance. I don't, I don't know a lot about that. So I don't like speaking on things that I don't know about, but I do know this, that you do not have to earn your right to rest. If anybody is telling you that, ignore them, uh, give them a book to read or something. But that's what this is talking about right here is just existing is enough. Just being alive is all you have to do to be worthy of respect. You don't have to accomplish any grand feat or any Herculean task. You just being you is enough. You're absolutely enough the way you are. And I like this book because it, like I said, it is part of the hope punk slash solar punk genre. But they have obviously been rebuilding their society since the end of the automation age when all the robots walked away and something happened. So they had to learn to be happy with what they have and to work together to build a new world where they can all get what they want. Um, and I really, really like that about this book. I like this about um, uh, the whole genre of hope punk. Um, I like that as, hey, things might not look so great right now, but we're working toward it to be better. We've got the tools, we've got the talent, we've got the heart for it, and we're going to try to make things better. So I really, really enjoy that. There's another one in here. Um, here is one, because Dex is really going through it and having a hard time 
thinking that their life is meaningless because they had they don't know what their purpose is. And Dex is asking Moss Cat, how does the idea of maybe being meaningless sit well with you? Moss Cap considered, because I know that no matter what, I'm wonderful. And Moss Cap was not being um, arrogant or anything. Um, but Moss Cap was like, because I know I'm amazing. I know that by some sort of miracle, here I am. Because these robots was breaking down. But somebody thought enough to put all these different parts from these many different robots together. And here I am. And the thing, too, Dex was talking about, because they don't have children, um, what were they going to leave behind? And um, Moss Cap had to let, let them know, well, my parents or the people whose parts I made out don't know me. They never even met me. But I'm still a sum of their parts, just like you're a sum of all the DNA and water in you and what you put your put mm -hmm, and how you put that to use. Is up to you, basically. So um, it's just a really phenomenal four-hour read. I really, really hope that y'all um, enjoyed this book and you get into it and read it. I'm going to wrap it up now. Let me see if there's any other things I want to um, add. Oh, there are. There are a couple other things I want to add. I'm just making sure that I uh, get all my notes and stuff out of this book so that when I turn it in, it's fresh. It's fresh for y'all. Let me see what else. There's some more quotes. Um, let's see. Here it is. So, um, when Dex first met Moss Cap, they were trying to ask, you know, how do I refer to you? And they said it. And Dex was like, Ooh, I don't like that. I, I don't, I don't know if I want to, um, call you an it. And then Moss Cap was like, we're machines and machines are objects. Objects are it's. I'd say you're more than just an object, Dex said. The robot looked a touch offended. I would never call you just an animal, sibling Dex. It turned its gaze to the road, head held high. We do not have to fall into the same category to be of equal value. You hear me? Y'all hear me? We do not have to fall into the same category to be of equal value. The robot knows this. That's why he uh, he had to tell Sibling Dex and how to teach Sibling Dex what humanity really, truly means. My goodness, there is no way that we're all going to fall into the same category, but we can still be of equal value. There, I, I could go upstairs right now. There's 10 people up there. We got 10 different things going on in our lives, but none of us is better than the other one. Not one of us. We are all of equal value. We're not in the same categories, and that's what makes us of equal value. It's the variety. So um, that was the quote that I've been looking for this whole time. I really like it, but I really like that part too, where sibling Dex knows, I know no matter what, I'm wonderful. I often tell people, I'm the universe's favorite child. That doesn't mean that the rest of y'all not the universe's favorite child, neither. The universe is vast and big. It, it could have as many favorite children as it wants to. I just know I'm one of them. And, and, and if you don't know that about yourself, then you can go and, and do these little journal prompts and learn that about yourself, too, because you'll find that things kind of work out for you when you expect them to. Not that you won't have any hard times and any tribulations, but things will work out for you in the end. And if things haven't worked out, then it's not the end, is it? Nope. Okay, let me see. I think I have one more question in me. Remember to share the live stream. Let me go on over here and um, remind y'all, like the page, give it a little likey like. And um, the last thing I'm gonna ask you to do is sign up for the newsletter. Highlight that and put it in your little search browser thingy and click on it, and then you can uh, get added to the, the newsletter. That's where a lot of the, the juiciness happens. Um, a lot of the um, uh, uh, synopses, the interviews, the videos that I find and whatnot. So if you have enjoyed this talk, please join the newsletter because there's more of that there. Also, on the Facebook page, we have discussions and whatnot as well. I check in a couple times a week, maybe once or twice a week. Um, until we have the book, uh, until we have the live stream. Um, but we're ch ch chatting back and forth about what the book is about, what our favorite parts are. Um, I also post a lot of the interviews and whatnot that I include in the newsletter as well. Okay, let's see. 
Ooh, throughout the last half of the novella, what moments of connection and growth did you find most compelling in Dex and Moss Cap's blossoming friendship? Was it a minor moment or a larger one that you related to? So, um, uh, hang on, what are we doing here? So, the one thing that I liked was when they stumbled upon that old factory that made um, robots. And it scared Moss Cap. Like, Moss Cap was like, ooh, I don't like it here. This is this is creepy. And he called it Reminence. And um, Dex had a similar experience when they didn't want to drink out of this water. It was full of algae and stuff. And it looked gross, like it might make them sick. And Moss Cap's like, oh, that's a remnant from you wanting to survive. And so... Um, Dex or Moss Cap says remnants are constructs and you'll never figure out life's mystery without constructs and you'll never grow beyond them as well if you don't do a little deep dive in here. And let me see if I can find that exact quote. Let me see. Ah, here they go. You know what? I don't see. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Here we go. Here it is. Without constructs, you will unravel few mysteries. Without knowledge of the mysteries, your constructs will fail. These pursuits are what make us. But without comfort, you will lack the strength to sustain either. So that's what I'm going to leave y'all with. Um, well, I'm going to leave you with a couple other things. I mean, let's talk about some more wonderfulness. Um, so again, what do humans really want? What does a meaningful life look like? How do you define meaningful work? Um, if you like this book, you might like A Prayer for the Crown Shy by Becky Chambers. She spelled her name on one C. I'm sorry, I put two C's in there. I told y'all I was dyslexic. But here is A Prayer for the Crown Shy right here. So we do have this book. It is a, roughly about the same length as um, A Prayer for the Wild Built. We get to hang out with our friend, uh, Sibling Dex and Moss Cap some more. So if you enjoyed that book and you don't want to quite say goodbye to your buddies yet, you don't have to. Go on and read the book. Read A Prayer for the Crown Shy. Also, there are a lot of books that the library has in this hope punk genre genre. <laughs> I like saying that like a homeboy from Alex, Alex Trebek from uh, Jeopardy. He was a French Canadian and he could actually say the word properly. Anywho, um, the, the correct pronunciation. Let me, let's not talk about proper because I'm from the South, y'all. Y'all can hear it. Anywho, um, some more books that we have here at the library that fall in the hope punk genre are All System Red, All Systems Red by Martha Wells. Binti by Nettie Okorafor, um, a, Cons a Conspiracy of Truths by Alexandria Rowland, This is How You Lose the Time War by Amal L. Motar, M-O-H-T-A-R, and Max Gladstone, The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemison, and Upright Woman Wanted by Sarah Galley. If y'all have been rocking with the book club for a while, we did a Sarah Galley book called The River of Teeth. Um, that's Sarah Galley. So um, if you are interested and in, I was reading those too quickly, uh, leave me a comment on this video and I'll put all of them in the chat below. I can actually probably do that right now. Um, we're getting close to time here though. But anywho, um, those are all a part of the hope punk genre. Um, people who are going through some hard times, but really are going to work together with the tools they have to make a better future. Um, let's see what else we got here. Thank you. Huh. 
thank y'all so much for hanging out with me for a little while today. I appreciate your time. I know it is very valuable and I'm honored that you decided to spend a little bit with me. So thank you so much. The next book uh, that we're going to be reading is Olga Dies Dreaming by Sochil Gonzalez. We're going to have the live stream on September the 28th um, at 4 p.m. right here. We have audio versions of this book as well as physical copies of this book. That's going to be, again, Olga Dies Dreaming by Sochil Gonzalez. Um, I hope y'all will join me for this wonderful read and I will see you next time. Let me uh, do this real quick. I'll see y'all next time. Have a good day and I'll see you next month. If not sooner, y'all should come to the library and say hi too. Okay, bye.